It's our um, first uh, gathering uh, under the new king, whether you're a monarchist or a republican. Um, uh, I was looking at, uh, just looking at all the, uh, the glorious uh, uniforms and everything last night and uh, thinking, um, you know, well, I said to the family, uh, who would want to be a republican? And you'd miss out on all this. And uh, <laughs> so, of course, they just uh, rolled their eyes and, uh, and uh, left me to myself. Um, this morning, um, we're actually, uh, we're going to be talking about religion and uh, being religious. And, and uh, our reading uh, this morning, if you want to follow through, uh, comes from uh, James chapter 1. We're going to read uh, James chapter 1. Uh, I'm reading from the uh, CSB. So, uh, and then, and in particular, the last two verses, which uh, mention the word religion or religious. So, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, without divided loyalties. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstances uh, boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises, and together with the scorching wind, dries up the grass." Its flower falls off and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God since God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone but each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire and then after desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and when sin is fully grown it gives birth to death don't be deceived my dear brothers and sisters Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We could almost go home after that one. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works. This person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue his religion is useless and he deceives himself 
pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray. Father, we want to come to you to thank you. Thank you for all your good creation, how you've made us for yourself. And we come this morning to worship you and acknowledge that you are our God. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we thank you for the reality of his life in us. And we come, Lord, this morning in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide, to lead us into truth, the truth. And Father, may the Holy Spirit be changing us to become more and more like Jesus, to enter in to this pure and undefiled religion. So, Father, we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The message uh, translates those last two verses of our reading. Uh, If anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father is this, reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from a godless world. We're uh, continuing our series uh, uh, from the book by um, Nijay Gupta, 15 uh, New Testament words of life and uh, he takes uh, 15 words that um, often we can uh, struggle with and uh, we find sometimes we find them hard to define or we misunderstood misunderstand what God really intended uh, when he wrote the scriptures we we can take the words out of context and today we we come to the word religion or religious, which um, is a contentious word in itself. And uh, if you'd asked me uh, years ago, well, it's actually this year, it's uh, 50 years since I became a Christian and uh, became a believer. And uh, before I started to read the Bible, if you'd said to me, how many times is the word religion mentioned in the Bible? I, I would have said, well, it must be countless times. I mean, that's what the Bible is all about. The old Bible is all about religion. And uh, wrong, fail, go to jail. Uh, the Bible really only uses this word uh, religion in James. And also, uh, I found it also seems to come up in Colossians, where it's actually translated uh, often uh, as worship. But the, it, it's got a similar sort of thing, as well, a meaning, as we'll start to see. But the next question, of course, is um, what is religion? What, what does it mean to be religious? And again, if you'd asked me um, uh, many years ago, I would have said, uh, well, to be religious, well, it depends which church you go to, which uh, denomination you belong to, or, or what's your cultural background? You know, are you... Um, uh, a Muslim or are you uh, Hindu or Buddhist and uh, the way we we use this word religion today I want us to see is not really the way when James uses it back in James that's not what he really uh, meant but for a lot of us the word religion can mean in, our, in the people we relate to in everyday life, it it can mean a kind of uh, a sort of mental framework or some way in which we think or our cultural uh, background. And if you look at, uh, I I looked up world religions and uh, there's really only about 15% of the world 
who would say they have no religion whatsoever. You know, uh, you've got about a third of the world calls themselves Christian in some form or another, and a quarter of the world are Muslim and 15% Hindu and 5% Buddhists. And, and here in Australia, we've got about 40% who would say, I've got no religion. And uh, five, uh, you know, five years ago, that was 30%. And at the start of this century, it was only 16%. So in a sense, in the last 20 years, we've doubled in the number of people who say they've got no religion uh, whatsoever. And, uh, but so much of it is a cultural background. Um, we have uh, had, had a friend who was a missionary in India and uh, he went there, he was working, but he was wanting to just relate his faith to, um, uh, in particular, to Hindu people. And uh, he had, had many Hindu friends and one of them said to him uh, one time, oh, I could never become a Christian. Uh, all the Christians I know, um, they're unfaithful to their wives and they drink too much and uh, I take my religion seriously. And uh, it, it knocked uh, my friend back a bit and he, and he, he, he had to realise that um, for so much, so much religion is just simply a cultural background that people have grown up with. It's, it's not really coming to, uh, to grips with, uh, with God and, uh, and who he is. And uh, even back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah had to... Um, say my people uh, in Jeremiah chapter 2 my my people have committed a double evil they've abandoned me the fountain of living water and they've dug cisterns or or water tanks for themselves cracked (coughs) cisterns that cannot hold water and I want us to see this morning that when James says if anyone thinks he is religious religion really is, uh, is about loving and worshipping God, the God of the Bible, the God who created us, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're swapping over. That sounds a bit better, doesn't it? Um, so true religion is, is loving and, and worshipping God and flowing out of that a love for people. God, through James, wants to change our thinking about what religion is, true religion. And according to James, religion is good, it's necessary. And, uh, and we're going to see a bit how he describes it. He doesn't necessarily define it, but he describes what true religion is about. At the time the Bible was written, people didn't really think of religion as some sort of optional extra, as though it was something that you could sort of, like, as as we often say, people go to, you know, might go to church on Sunday, but it doesn't make any difference to the rest of their life. Um, We had uh, relatives staying with us one time many years ago. And we were just chatting about all sorts of things. And, uh, and I, it just came up about uh, Jesus. And, uh, and I said, well, if, if, if someone disproved that Jesus um, didn't rise from the dead, I wouldn't be a Christian. And I can still remember the, their, the amazement on their faces because for them... Christianity was, you know, my Christianity, oh, well, what's good for you, Harold? You know, that's fine for you, but it doesn't really affect me. You know, I've got my beliefs, you've got your beliefs. But to see following Jesus as based on the historical facts of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and that he's made us and that we, he's accountable to us, uh, we're accountable to him that's true religion. That's, that's what James is trying to communicate to us. That, uh, as Mr. Gupta says, religion for almost all ancient people was obligation. 
you know, the gods were the divine rulers and we mortals, we owe them thanks, respect and obedience. And James is wanting to take us from more, uh, more than just the altar and the temple, but into everyday life, into the way we speak, into the way we live, into the way that we relate to people. And, and he says, and, and James himself refers back to the Old Testament. When you look at the Ten Commandments, uh, the first part of the commandments is, is about loving God and worshipping him and having no idols, having that loyalty to God. But then the second half is all about loving people. And the Old Testament uh, continues that when Deuteronomy 6 you know, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then, uh, as, as Sam reminded us from uh, Leviticus uh, that we went through last week, uh, love your neighbour as yourself. That religion in the Old Testament was not just a, a man-made list of chores. And so often we can think about religion like that. But it's a dynamic relationship with God where we're living in this living relationship with him. Some years ago, um, a, uh, a man called Bethke um, did a sort of a series of uh, podcasts or YouTube films on why I hate religion but love Jesus. And... I can understand to a certain extent why he was appealing against the, the, just the religion that is just an outward show instead of a living relationship with Jesus. But because James uses this word religion, we've got to, I think God wants us to think through what, are we, what is my religious life like? And, and I think he was a you know, appealing against a kind of compartmentalised life where our religion is, you know, Sunday morning I'm religious uh, but for the rest of the week it doesn't really matter. And that's never been God's intention with our, with our lives. Um, it's like uh, we read in, in uh, James 1.22, you know, don't deceive yourself. It, it's not just a matter of listening to the word of God it's a matter of obeying it and he goes on in James 2 to talk about if you see someone in need it's not enough to just say I'll pray for you or you know or have a nice word when within your means you can actually help someone in a practical way and then he goes on to talk about the rich and uh, and you're giving your lives to things that are not going to last for eternity. Um, Mr Gupta uh, says, well, James is like the Amos of the Old Testament. And uh, as I read him, I, I had to look that up. And, uh, and in, in Amos, Amos says a prophet is speaking to the people of Israel and, uh, and he says, you bring your sacrifices every morning your, your, your tithes every three days, you offer leavened bread as a thanksgiving sacrifice, you loudly proclaim your free will offerings, for that's what you Israelites love to do. And, and what he was saying, their religion had become something that almost in a sense they could boast about. You know, look, look God at all we do. We make these sacrifices, we bring these things to you instead of realizing God was the one who had delivered them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them in to a promised land and they just wanted to compartmentalize this kind of life, this living relationship with God into, well, I do this and I do that. And, 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 and he says, and the problem is that you... You're trampling on the poor, he goes on to say, and, and you, you actually oppress, you oppress good people. You take bribes, you deprive the poor of justice at the city gates. 
it, it reminds you of what Jesus had to say about, uh, which we'll, we'll look at a bit later on. So James is, is saying, first of all, that religion is about loving and worshipping God and flowing out of that a love for people because God loves people. James himself describes himself as, as a servant of God. And he, in chapter 2, he's going to say, don't show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious uh, Lord Jesus. Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scriptures, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing well. He has a very solemn word in chapter 2. You believe that God is one, good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? So James is never for one minute saying that we're saved by what we do. It's all by faith in Jesus and what Jesus has done. But if we think we have true religion, if we think we have true faith, but it doesn't make any difference in our lives... James is saying it's not true faith. We haven't come to that point where we've entered in to true religion. Uh, I remember years ago a friend uh, sharing how his faith, he'd always in a sense believed in God, but he said it was like a head belief and, uh, and it, it had to drop 400 millimetres to his heart. Now, he wasn't talking about his physical heart, but what he was saying was that for him, religion had been an intellectual thing that he hadn't necessarily disagreed with. He'd, he'd accepted it, but it had never become a part of his life, about his everyday life. And there came that point where he did call on the name of Jesus, and he said it went from his head to his heart. I need to qualify that because we should never stop thinking when we become a Christian. That's another false religion. But God wants it to become a living relationship with him. Even the devils believe in Jesus. But it's when we come to love and worship God, which the devil can never do. And that will flow out into loving others. You know, let's think about Jesus when he came 2,000 years ago on earth. He was surrounded by religious people. You know, here were the scribes and Pharisees. They knew whole slabs of scripture. You know, they'd memorized it from childhood upwards. And, uh, and, and Jesus had to say, this is a false religion. He, you know, he actually says in Matthew 23, don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they're unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. And the kind of religion that Jesus is talking about is not a religion to be seen by others. It's from the heart before God because we love and worship God himself you um, you pay he says to the Pharisees and scribes you pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin you've got all these little things that you focus on and yet you've neglected the more important matters of the law justice and mercy and faithfulness these things should have been done without neglecting the others but you clean the outside of the cup and the dish. You're like whitewashed tombs. It's a wonder they didn't crucify him straight away. But it was on his heart that here was a people who thought they were religious. But they weren't. And you think of the, the man that he healed. He looked around and he saw the hardness of their hearts. And when we don't truly love and worship God, it affects the way we look at people. 
because God loves people with an incredible love. And it's only when we enter in to truly loving and worshipping God ourselves that we can enter into that love for people that is God's love. It's a bit like last week, you know, Sam reminded us that Jesus said, my peace I give with you, to you. It, it's his peace and it's the same with love for people. My love for people can be pretty weak but we enter into life with God's love for people that learns, learns to relate in a new way. Jesus was surrounded by this false religion. He said in John 5, the father who sent me, he's testified about me. You don't have his word residing in you. You haven't allowed the word of God to really settle in your hearts. And you, you pour over the scriptures. You can be religious externally, looking at the Bible all the time, but because you think, you know, that'll give you eternal life. But these scriptures testify about me. And you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. And I, I can put my hand up as being guilty. You read the Bible, but you haven't really met Jesus and heard his voice. And so, yes, I think it's great that you can aim to have a regular Bible reading. But you've got to, we've got to keep asking ourselves, am I meeting Jesus? Am I learning from him? Because that is true religion, to love and, and worship uh, Jesus. It's not just looking in the mirror, you know, and, and you might see a bit of dirt or a bit of spot or something in the mirror, but you go away and you forget that it's there. And someone through the day will say, oh, you've got a bit of a bit of spot there or a mark there on your face. Looking at the Bible is like looking in the mirror because we not only see what God is like, but we see what we are like. And we start to see how he wants to change us to become more and more like him. The new, the new king last night, one of his promises was to look after the widows and the orphans. And uh, James is not defining religion by that, but he's saying that how do you assess whether your religion is true? How much do we care for those and love those who can't pay us back? Back in those days, an orphan and a widow, there wasn't much in the way of social security. And if you helped an orphan or a widow, they wouldn't most likely be ever able to pay you back. You know, Jesus uh, said in Luke 14, you know, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbours, because they might invite you back. He's not against family reunions, but he's just saying it's so easy to invite people into your life who can pay you back. I mean, you know, in, back in my working life, that was the classic of the, the, the business lunches and setting up your network of people who would be able to pay you back and give you more work. And Jesus says the kingdom doesn't operate like that. You know, while we were just so helpless and could never pay God back, Jesus helped us. He came to us. And so when James is saying pure and undefiled religion is to look after orphans and widows, uh, it reminded me of Paul when he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know brothers and sisters about the grace of God that was given to these churches first of all they gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by God's will and if we're going to enter in to this true religion of loving and worshipping God it begins first of all with giving ourselves to the Lord 
there are plenty of people in the world who are very hard to love. There are times I can be hard to love. And, and God says, first of all, the only way to live out this true religion is, is first of all to give ourselves to the Lord and, and, to, and then allowing his life to flow through us. Mr Gupta finishes the chapter in his book by telling the story about how he and his wife were having a coffee in, uh, uh, in an outdoor uh, cafe and um, uh, a man came up to them and said, uh, oh, have you got any spare change so that I can get a coffee? And, um, and uh, he, re- he replied, uh, no, sorry, sorry, man, I can't, I can't do that for you. And the man, uh, he, he went to walk away and then he turned around and he said, do you ever do anything for anyone? And, uh, you know, Mr Gupta said, I've never been asked that uh, point blank like that before, but it made him think, and I think it ought to make us think we can get very comfortable in what we give. And I think this whole thing of religion ought to make us think, first of all, about how much we love God, but then how much, as a result, that we give to others. Um, years ago, he, he quotes uh, a Francis Schaeffer, who was uh, a pastor in the States, who went off to Switzerland and set up a uh, Labrie fellowship where people would just it was like an open home in a sense and they just opened up their home to all sorts of people who would come to talk about their lives and about spiritual things and he and he said how should we live personal peace means just to be left alone for many people not to be troubled by the troubles of other people whether across the world or across the city to live one's life with minimal possibilities of being personally disturbed. Personal peace means wanting to have my personal life pattern undisturbed in my lifetime, whatever the result. And affluence means overwhelming and ever-increasing prosperity, a life made up of things, things and more things, a success judged by an ever higher level of material abundance and when you give your life to those who can't give back Jesus actually says you're more blessed he says you it is more blessed to give than to receive it's more blessed you you will actually get a far more fulfilled life when you start to live this religion that loves and worships God and flows out into living and helping others. A passage that has meant a lot to Ruth and myself over the years has been in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, look, I'm ready to come to you this third time. I will not burden you since I'm not seeking what's yours but you. It's a beautiful phrase to think. You know, we as a church don't make big appeals for money. But our appeal is not for what is yours, not for your things, But for you, that you, each one of you, might first of all give yourselves to the Lord. That's true religion, to love and worship God first of all, and then to live out his love towards others, especially towards those who cannot pay you back. We were at a wedding recently in Hobart, and I caught up with a friend who we've known for years. He's an elder in that church. And he, he, we were chatting and he said uh, there's, there was a young man who 
had come recently and been coming for a number of weeks and uh, and then he just stopped coming and uh, he uh, my friend rang him oh how are you you know just noticed you haven't been coming and uh, everything all right and he said oh I've, I've just found this uh, incredible set of uh, messages online and, and this great series of podcasts. And, uh, and that's all I really want out of church. I just want to make sure I'm getting fed and I've got these great preachers. And, um, and my friend shared with him and said, they can be great preachers, but you're missing out because Jesus says... It's more blessed to give than to receive. And when we come along to church, and uh, first of all, we've given ourselves to the Lord, but then we start to see that it is more blessed to give than to receive. That God can give us, as it says in Isaiah 50 verse 4, he gives me a word for the weary one. And any time we gather, there are going to be people who are weary. And we can be such a blessing. You may think, oh, I'm only a young Christian or I haven't got much to offer. I remember an older man talking with me once after a gathering. And he said to me, you know, see those young people there? They're probably thinking they haven't got much to offer. But they're such an encouragement to me because... They're the future of the church. And I, I just want us to think, if we're, we think of religion, sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking it's, it's about receiving. And we do need to receive that word. But it's even more so as we start to grow in our walk with God, it's about giving, about giving to others and being a blessing in their lives and God through his word and by his Holy Spirit can make us into that kind of person and as Paul says in Philippians 3 that we might start to lay hold of that for which Jesus has laid hold of us and enter into true religion to love and worship God and to love other people. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us as a fellowship to just enter in to true religion, to love and worship you with all our heart and to love others. And uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.